Um, let me just grab my phone for grabbing the questions. Uh, so uh, for anyone that doesn't yet know, um, we're here with uh, Dr. Warren Farrell. He's, uh, I, I, you know, he's got a PhD in political science, I think two PhDs in psychology, is that right? No, just a PhD in political science. And, um, I, I thought you had a, an honorary degree or something like that. Well, I have an honorary degree, but I don't really count. Eh, it counts. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> then I have another PhD. <laughs> <laughs> so Dr. Warren O'Farrell, who's got a handful of PhDs? <laughs> um, he's a world-renowned feminist. You've been involved. Now, I got it wrong last time. But was it since the 60s in the movement? Yeah, that's right. That's since 1969, um, I, I was I joined now the National Organization for Women um, in New York City. Well, and now, and then I, I was on the board of directors of the National Organization for Women in New York City for um, three three years, uh, from 1970 to 1974. All right, and so um, you know, Dr. Warren Farrell's been involved with the movement for quite a while, and uh, recently, now I know people have tagged you as MRA, but you wouldn't consider yourself a men's rights activist, would you? No, I consider myself a gender liberation activist. I'm in favor of uh, freeing ourselves from the restrictive roles that both sexes had in the past uh, to more flexible roles for our future. All right. So um, without any further ado, um, let's get into some questions. So first, I just want to ask, you know, broad question here. Uh, what did you think of uh, the debate you had with uh, Vosh or uh, Vouch. It was uh, billed as a debate originally, um, and it seemed like there was a lot more agreement than was expected. Yes, um, I, usually that happens when I'm debating somebody from a feminist perspective who, you know, has heard about the portion of me that has been critical of portions of feminism that I feel have um, done too much um, putting of men in the position of being the oppressor and women in the position of being the oppressed. I feel that's extremely disrespectful of women and extremely um, uh, violating um, the, the actuality of what has happened in history. It's a, it's a lack of understanding of history, lack of understanding of biology, a lack of understanding of the, of, of the feminist movement itself. And so, um, I, um, so I, I've confronted that portion of it, but where we agreed so much is I'm, I always have been, always will be, a very strong supporter of uh, opening up as many options as possible for women, um, both for my two daughters and um, and for really women who are not my daughters. It doesn't make any difference. Um, that's uh, one of my goals in life. But um, um, I see the I see this the the obstacles to doing that um, and the role of the feminist movement having gone from extremely constructive and positive to a mixture of constructive and destructive and a mix and, a, and extremely um, helping to empower women at the beginning to both empowering and disempowering women more recently. And so I obviously uh, have been a very strong supporter of the portions of feminism that are empowering of women and, uh, and a critic of the portions of feminism that have uh, honed victimhood as a fine art and depended too much on victim power which in my opinion, when you depend on victim power, you always undermine the respect for people who rely on victim power. All right, so our first question from uh, uh, the users is from uh, Skullboy. He wants to know, do you think complete equality between women and men will ever be reached in the near future? Complete equality of opportunity can, should be, and must be reached complete equality of outcome is hi highly unlikely in a dozen different ways because there is a biological heritage that is very different for women and for men. There's been biological roles that are different for women and for men. The, the only, the, the challenge that many conservatives have is believing that those roles are natural, that they are, uh, that, they, that, that we shouldn't deviate from them and that God intended us to have these roles. Well, whether God intended us to have these roles or not, um, I'm sure God intended us to also be functional. And the, the things that were functional for both sexes before survival was having rigid roles to follow that were, that were in alignment with helping both sexes survive. And those roles limited men and limited women in different ways. A woman who was uh, you know, a, a natural uh, genius, 
uh, was not going to be encouraged by her guidance counselor um, to become uh, to to take full advantage of being that genius or um, you know uh, uh, being a, a, the head of some cor corporation. Um, and that was a shame. We missed the contributions of millions of women. And conversely, a man like, like myself, who's more oriented toward being uh, I'm sort of more of a nurturer connector than a provider protector. Um, I hope I do provide decently, but I'm not, you know, I'm not out there to figure out how to climb to the top of a, of a corporate ladder. That's not my style and my, my personality. And so, and, you know, but people never came, women never came up to me and said, you know, gee, I, I, I see that you have a really good listening style and you're empathetic and so on. Um, you would be a good, you know, full-time father. Um, I'd be very interested in our, because I, I, I'm, I'm, I want to be a have it all woman. I want to be able to great, break through glass ceilings. I want to be able to um, have children, have a happy marriage and have somebody taking care of the children that I can really trust. You seem like that type of man. Could we have maybe, a, could, could we have a date and sort of talk about, um, you know, possibly getting together. Uh, those, you know, I was never approached, never once in my life approached for that part of my personality. Uh, when I was student body president or in high school or, you know, was um, on TV all the time and writing books, you know, then I began to be, um, you know, uh, admired and respected by many women. Um, but, uh, and I felt my attractiveness increase, if you will. Uh, but it was always my attractiveness increase because of my performance um, and not because of my, um, any part of the nurturing or empathetic qualities that I had. That was always a valued addition somewhat like Lois Lane, um, you know, had ignored Clark Kent completely. Um, but then um, when um, he, she found out that Clark Kent was in fact Superman, then she fell in love with the exact same person who once she found out he was Superman. And then she valued herself and her own contribution to Superman by getting Superman to cry and be open and expressive. But she had no interest in Superman when she didn't, uh, when she didn't know, um, when she thought he was only Clark Kent. And so we've made a, an enormous transition, um, but the, uh, the focus recently on women um, being victims um, is, uh, is undermining the, uh, the, uh, the willingness of so many um, male mentors to mentor women. Um, and we, we know from Cynthia Epstein's work um, that, the, um, that the women who go the farthest are ones that are uh, that are mentored by um, by males, and even when there's equal numbers of females uh, available, historically speaking, the males have been more willing to devote uh, time and energy uh, to uh, mentoring those women. But the uh, the atmosphere for mentoring women today uh, would make any man, particularly any man who is married, a fool uh, for um, taking the risks that are involved in um, in mentoring women, and that is. Uh, something that is um, a shame and that I oppose. Now, I'm not positive I answered um, 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 Bonehead's question um, or Bone, what was his, his name? Bone, but his, um, what was the name of the gentleman who asked the question? I believe it was, uh, that was a uh, skull boy. <laughs> skull boy, sorry about that, Bonehead. Bonehead. <laughs> and the, the question was, <laughs> <laughs> the question was an intelligent question, not not deserving of bonehead, but skull. <laughs> uh, so, what was, tell, tell me his question again, because I, I have a feeling I, I sort of got sidetracked and didn't answer his question respectfully or fully. Um, uh, real quick, he wrote in chat, does my name make you think I sound stupid? <laughs> um, uh, so his question, uh, I think you answered it, was, uh, do you think complete equality between women and men will be reached in the near future? Uh, yes. So, the, so if equ equality of outcome will probably never be reached, there will always be a genetic heritage of differences between men and women. Um, but um, we can never use that average difference as, uh, as a reason to prevent a woman who is different from being able to manifest her difference in the world and also uh, preventing people like myself or men who are sort of more uh, the nurturing, the nurture connector type of men rather than the provider protector from men from being valued in the society. And at this point in history, 
we value the the produce the you know, provider protector woman more than we value the nurture connector man. And um, but I'm in favor of those opportunities being more available to both sexes to change the the uh, stereotype sex roles, and including um, very much in favor of of trans men and women um, being willing to be being supported by the community and being supported by a lack of ostracism and and gay men and gay women uh, being supported in that way. And those are the ways that, um, that, that were not available to my generation growing up because um, the, if you look back in the Bible, you'll, under, you'll get that there, there was no, there was, everything is about survival. There was no permission in the Bible for sex without the sex involving a man taking care of woman, a woman for a lifetime in exchange for one act of sex. That's why you had to be married in order to be able to have sex. That's why premarital sex was a sin. That's why gay sex was a sin because gay sex was an hour of pleasure in exchange for an hour of pleasure. Heterosexual sex was an hour of pleasure or maybe 15 minutes of pleasure in exchange for a lifetime of responsibility. Um, you know, heterosexuality was a bad deal. Um, you weren't allowed to masturbate in the, in, in the Bible. That was a sin also. It was a sin because you were getting sex for free. The, the whole purpose of sexuality was to, was to be about uh, immortality, not immorality. And so the, the Bible morphed the, any, any jeopardy of immortality into a statement of immorality. And so we, we prevented ourselves from being full human beings from being able to do things like have sex before marriage, um, have sex with the same sex, masturbate. Those were all things that the Bible considered sins because the, the Bible was focused, like all traditional cultures are focused on making sure that both sexes have very strict roles and, they, and the life was not about doing what you wanted to do. Life was about doing what you needed to do. I, I, maybe the best way that I can illustrate that is really to be personal here for a minute. Um, when I um, uh, when I first moved to California, um, I moved to San Diego, and my father came out and visited me for the first time. And it was three days that he and um, my mom, my, mom uh, my stepmom, were with me. And he had not said a, asked me a single question about myself. And I uh, I finally, after three days, said, "You know, Dad, the only thing you've been talking about for three days is yourself, um, and you haven't asked me a single question about myself." long pause. And my father said, well, um, I want to keep our relationship good. And I said, Dad, it doesn't enhance our relationship to only talk about one person in um, a relationship. That's not a relationship. That's a monologue. Um, another long pause. Do you really want me to ask you about you? I said, yes. So what is the reason you wouldn't? Another long pause. Well, this was on when I was on TV a great deal. Um, the work you do, I feel, is ruining the lives of millions of people. So I, the only place I could go with that was to joke and say, "Well, I don't think that I'm, you know, um, ruining the lives of millions of people. I don't even, I don't affect millions of people." Um, and but after the joke, um, I said, "Tell me why you think that." And he said, because you're teaching people psychology. Psychology trains people to think about what they want to do. Life isn't about what you want to do, Warren. Being a man isn't doing, about doing what you want to do. Being a real man is doing what you need to do, what you have to do, what you're obliged to do. Doing a man is thinking about your children, your wife. It's not thinking about yourself. The moment you ask people to think about themselves, their needs, their desires, you undermine that resolve, that discipline to do what, uh, do what you need to do in life, which is to take care of your family, not just to take care of yourself. And I said, wow, dad, that is really powerful. And I really appreciate your saying that. And yet dad, I think that your generation has done the hard work of helping people take care of survival to a much greater degree than it had ever been taken care of before. And you've brought me up in the middle class, sure, the middle working class, 
but you've brought me up with a, you know, with a high school and then a college education. And that creates, I no longer have to focus on surviving. I do have to care about surviving, but I don't have to make it my primary goal. You have freed me and your generation has freed our generation to make decisions that no one was ever free to make before throughout history. I, maybe I have been at fault for not thanking you and thanking your generation enough. I've been at fault for protesting the Vietnam War and, um, and you felt that therefore I've been unpatriotic and maybe a communist at heart. Um, and so I haven't acknowledged your generation for creating the freedom for me to be who I am, uh, to be a human being rather than a human doing. And so um, that was sort of, that, that dialogue actually happened over a few weeks, uh, not a few minutes, like I just um, uh, catalyzed it into, um, but uh, compressed it into, um, but, the, um, but I think you get the point. Yeah, uh, I mean, that seems like a actually pretty profound. It reminds me um, of something I, I had to look up as you were saying it. Um, Adam, Adam, Adam Smith, John Smith, John Adams. Oh, jeez, <laughs> got it all jumbled. John <laughs> Adams. <laughs> oh, John Adams and Adam Smith. They were two very different people. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I wonder if you're familiar with this quote, but also like, you know, what your thoughts are on it. Because it seems very similar, obviously in different vein, very similar. He wrote that, um, he said, I must study politics in a word that my sons may have liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. My yeah. sons ought to study mathematics and philosophy, geography, natural history, naval architecture, navigation, commerce, and agriculture in order to give their children a right to study painting, poetry, music, architecture, uh, tapestry, and porcelain. Absolutely. Now, who said that? Was it um, John Adams or Adam Smith? John Adams. <laughs> <laughs> That's as bad as me with the bone. <laughs> and by the way, I thought that was a very intelligent question. <laughs> One that opens up a lot of doors. So <laughs> make it clear that, that we're working with my memory being the problem. <laughs> Not the fellow who asked the question. But... Uh... So yeah, uh, let me see, I'll grab another question here. Uh, we've got one from Blob, but they want to know, what would you think of including women into very popular sports dominated by men? Would this contribute in liberation and inclusivity of genders, especially in countries where women are not allowed in sports at all? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. Uh, meaning that I think that if we really want to have full respect, uh, you know, if, Here's an example of why we have such a challenge here, because if women really were the same as men, and, and um, then there is no reason why the sports should be segregated into male sports and female sports. We should just have them all be um, sports, and the best people at basketball, football, uh, volleyball, or whatever would be the best people at those, or tennis, uh, would be the best people at those games. Uh, there would not be the best of three wins for um, a tennis tournament if you're female and the best of five for a tennis tournament if, you may, if you're male. And then the women complaining about not being paid equally to the men for the same, quote, same work, which is not the same work. Um, and so, the, uh, so if we think the sexes are the same, we'd have all the sexes integrated. If we really care more about women than any other group in the, in the world, then we would separate women's sports and men's sports. Now, why did I say than any other group in the world? Because any other group in the world, in, in basketball, we have a disproportionate number of, of black males. We don't say there has to be um, the same proportion of black males as there is um, black males in the culture or in the, in the country, and which would leave us with 12% black males and 88% um, and um, white and other cook, um, and Asian males and so on. We don't say that the NBA should have, um, because there are fewer, fewer Jewish people, fewer white people, uh, fewer Asian people in the NBA, that we should have an Asian basketball league, a, um, a, a Caucasian basketball league, um, a, um, a Jewish basketball league, and so on. Um, because, um, but we do that special treatment for women only. And so the advantage is that we get to see a lot of wonderful women who, and the advantage is that millions of women are um, inspired to train to be more athletic than they would otherwise be. 
the the thing that nobody questions or ever looks at is that is both an advantage and it's also an insult. It's also a statement to women that you really can't compete with males on the average. Um, and we're going to give you a special place. Whenever you give people a special place, that, that, that often morphs into having a disrespect for that group that gets something special, that gets something uh, advantages or affirmative action that is, that is different than it is for, the, for other people who are expected to achieve more in order to get the same as you. All right. Um, next question we have here uh, is from Edgy. He wants to know, what is the utility of gender that is not offered in biological sex? What is the utility of gender that is not offered in biological sex? Um, so I'm thinking that the question is, uh, that I'm translating in my mind, is uh, what, what purposes do gender serve aside um, from the, the sexual connection between men and women? Is, um, is that, maybe could you ask the question, Edgy, if that is the, um, is that, if that was, is his best or her best intent in that question? Uh, let's see. Edgy is not able to be here right now. He wrote that one in beforehand. Nice. Um, I think what he's trying to get at here is um, the uh, distinction between uh, gender identity um, as now, I, I think for most people, this is a recent phenomenon, um, being divorced from sex. Yes. Okay. So I, I'll take my best stab at what I think is meant by that question. So for example, um, your fire volunteer firefighters, um, this is firefighters that are not paid. They not paid a penny. And yet uh, almost a hundred percent of them are male and it has nothing to do with the sexual interaction of those firefighters with anybody. Um, it has merely to do with the heritage, biological heritage of men over the course of um, millions of years and animals, um, whether it's uh, insects, um, um, buck elks, um, or whatever um, that, that had led to the female selecting for sexuality, the alpha male. So for example, among buck elks, the female, uh, the 85% the, the of the, um, the, the sexual interaction between the female and the male is the female selecting the, num the one alpha male who has the biggest racks. And so, um, but to get those biggest racks, um, it, it is uh, the, the alpha male that has the biggest rack um, exhausts about 30% of his um, calcium, nutritions, and minerals. Um, so he then becomes the weakest male that only appears as the strongest male. And so that's what I mean when I say oftentimes that men's weakness is their facade of strength. Because if he doesn't get rid of that rack immediately after procreation um, by um, the rutting process of rubbing it off on a tree, um, he will then uh, risk dying be, um, if the winter comes on before he replenishes his nutrition and minerals and calcium. And so this, um, this men's weakness being their facade of strength um, is what men have always been willing to do because we wanted um, sex with, uh, with the woman that was reproducing. So we tried to become the male that they would, uh, that they would um, choose. And the, the, the biological heritage that created that is that the male that got chosen, the alpha male, was the one that had the, uh, the children. But, we, we, but, but, was, but what no one has recognized and what I tried to explain in the Boy Crisis book and also in the myth of male power is that this power, this supposed power of having the biggest rack, this supposed power of being the volunteer fireman that is uh, respected by the women, um, this is also um, our willingness to be powerless, to be willing to die for the purpose of procreating with a woman or saving women, saving children, saving homes, saving other families. We've been, uh, so the, the definition of masculinity historically has been the training to be disposable. Disposable in each generation's war, 
and are disposable in the workplace by doing um, the, ha the hazardous jobs. 93% of the people who die in the workplace um, are males. Um, and in the in war, historically, it has been um, you know ab about 99% of males that have uh, that have died in battle, and it's it's um, less a little bit less than that today. Um, but it's still males that are far more likely to die in battle or be seriously injured in battle today. Um, and so uh, the, the, the biological heritage of both sexes was for women to seek the protector and for men to be willing to be disposable in order to be loved. That's why we compete in junior high school and high school and in college. We compete to be the football player who gets spinal cord injuries, concussions, and broken bones so that we get the cheerleaders saying, first and 10, do it again. And when the cheerleader says, first and 10, do it again, what are they saying? Risk a concussion again, risk a spinal cord injury again. Show us how brave you are. Show us how willing you are to risk being disposable. Then we will love you. We will say, first and 10, do it again. Every football player knows unconsciously that, and not consciously usually, that if he loses his position on the team, there's no cheerleader that comes up to him and says, you know, I know you lost your position on the team, but I was noticing when you were playing football how warm and tender and open and listening and caring and nurturing you were. Um, I want to continue cheering for you. She, he notices instead that she cheers all right. She cheers though for his replaceable part. And so therefore he's likely to be not be loved unless he's being willing, he's willing to experience uh, abuse. And when that abuse comes in, in, um, uh, in, in the early years, in, in the early football um, leagues, um, those, that starts at age eight, nine, 10, uh, that's basically child abuse. And so men learn to associate being abused and being disposable with being loved. When a woman falls in love, she falls in love with the officer and the gentleman, not the private and the pacifist. Um, his willingness to be disposable is what buys her love. All right. And um, <clears throat> just touching off something you mentioned there um, uh, about child abuse, uh, Bird knows one, I'm sorry, Bird knows one would like to know, uh, what is your thought on, uh, I think this is a little bit loaded, but genital mutilation for males or circumcision? Yeah, I think that genital mutil like, mutilation for males is the way we trained males to, to be disposable in order to be a male. So the more warrior-like the culture is, um, the more likely the, the, the more the culture is going to take, is not going to circumcise males when they're infants, but they'll wait until those males are ready to be, um, have a ritual that admits them through the doors of, from the do doors of boyhood into the doors of manhood. So a typical ritual will be getting the boy who is about ready to enter manhood around in the center of the community and then um, have all the males in the community surround him. And in the center, um, and he is then, um, has hit the edge of his penis um, cut off and he's circumcised, circumcised in public. If he does not, but he is not allowed to even wince or say ow or complain in any way or cry or withdraw, Other, if he does, he is not considered a male and he does not enter into the um, in, into malehood. And therefore the women in the culture um, uh, that are the most valued by the, the people, meaning usually the most beautiful, um, are not um, supposed to get involved with that male who is basically not really a, a, a male, a, a man. He's just still a boy and therefore not worthy of the, of the most attractive women in the culture. And so, the, the whole purpose of the original purposes of circumcision are to sort of, it's a primal way of preparing men, um, boys usually who are infants in current day cultures, to be able to handle pain without complaining, um, or when they do complain, nevertheless have that pain imposed on them anyway. And um, you know, now there is arguments as to whether um, circumcision is valuable for um, reasons of, um, of public sanity and health, and that most, most evidence shows that it's not needed, except in cultures where there's a, a great deal of exposure to um, uh, you know, lack of um, 
of, of healthy water and uh, dirty water and so on. And then there are better arguments that circumcision in those cultures is of greater value. Um, but the basic function of circumcision uh, was an outgrowth of the whole process, like football, of training men to be able to handle pain, uh, not complain, or uh, as infants complain as is natural, but just learn to handle it anyway. And we never cared about studying what was the impact. What are the, you know, a control group of boys that that were circumcised versus those that were not circumcised? What, where, you know, what how, does that have a long-term impact or a short-term impact on those infants? Is it, it is, 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 are they more likely to have mental health problems? Are they more likely to suffer from PTSD as a result of the circumcision? We didn't care enough about men's health to be able to, to even ask those questions. And on a non-circumcision level, today we, our lack of caring about men's health um, is such that we have seven federal offices of men's health. We have, even though men die an average of five years sooner than women, we have zero federal offices of men's health. And all the efforts that people like myself have made and the Men's Health Network have made to get, um, uh, to get um, uh, men, even one federal office of men's health, they've all gone, um, they have all, they've all not been paid attention to, even though it is only men's life expectancy that has decreased for the last three years in a row. Never in recorded history has the life expectancy of either gender um, decreased for even two years in a row. Uh, no less three years in a row, and especially not in wartime. Uh, so I wonder if this next question actually plays into that, especially with the coronavirus. Um, Yidikis wants to know, what is your opinion on the male suicide epidemic we are experiencing? First of all, um, the, my first part of the opinion is that, that your question is so thoughtful because Virtually nobody, you know, a relatively small percentage of people, maybe 30% of people know, um, know that there is such an increase in the male suicide rate and what those gaps are. And, and then B, very, most people don't care enough to ask the question. So just you're caring enough to ask the question um, is a step in the right direction. So here's the data, here's a, one of the pieces of data on suicide that I think is most helpful to um, understand a lot about it. And um, at the age of nine, um, boys and girls rarely commit suicide, and they commit suicide equally. Um, at the age of 10 to 14, boys commit suicide uh, twice as often as girls do. Between the ages of 15 and 19, boys commit suicide four times as often as girls do. Between the ages of 20 and 24, boys commit suicide five times as often as young females do or females do. And so there is, um, but the great majority of people in the culture don't even know that. Um, over the age of 85, when men and women, um, the men who live, uh, they are 1,750% more likely to commit suicide than their female counterparts. The, 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 the percentage of the American population that knows that is probably one-tenth of 1%. 1 if the reverse were true, if girls were committing suicide so much more frequently between the ages of nine and 24, 25 than boys were, I think almost all of us would know that statistic. And if women, adult women, um, older women were 85 and older, were committing suicide four times as often as their male, I'm sorry, 1,750% times as often as their male counterparts, I think we would all know that. And we would all consider those things an example of how oppressive the female role is and maybe how oppressor, how much uh, men are the oppressors uh, when it comes to gender um, differences. And so, uh, but when the reverse is true, we don't even know the data for the most part. And the reason we don't know the data is because our survival historically has been dependent upon males training themselves to be disposable, disposable in war, disposable in work. We've given boys and men social bribes to be disposable. A social bribes like calling them hero um, and maybe having a picture of our uncle who was in the Marines on, you know, on a, on a, um, a credenza or a, a cabinet somewhere. And the, um, 
and everybody talking about how brave Uncle M M Mike was. And so the boy is learning, boy, I want to be called brave. I want to be like Uncle Mike. I want to be respected by everybody. And that's part of his preparation for being willing to be disposable by joining the Marines like his Uncle Mike did and get all that type of praise and respect. And in the process, either um, come home with some type of PTSD or lifelong injury physically or not come home at all. And so when we know our children, and this is the key point, when we know we have a son and we have a daughter and we're training our son to be disposable, it's harder to emotionally attach to the person we know we may lose than it is to emotionally attach to the daughter that we know we want to protect. And in addition to that, the second huge understanding or insight is that in order to train to be disposable, you have to not be in touch with your feelings. So the political liberals call men toxic and the political conservatives say, no, men are just right the way they are. I disagree with both. The political liberal, liberals, yes, men have developed toxicities because not of male privilege and male power and male entitlement, but rather because of male obligation and male subservience to the need to be willing to be disposable in order to be considered a male. So disconnecting from your feelings is toxic. It disconnects you from yourself as a human being, and it only allows you to express yourself as a human doing. And as a human doing, it, that's, that cuts off your entire being a human being, and that is toxic. Um, but, and so that's what conservatives don't understand but what liberals don't understand is why is that that toxicity is not part of the evolution of male privilege and entitlement and power and oppressiveness. It is the male experience of being oppressed. Uh, so I think you touched on this a bit, but I remember when I was in college, uh, there were organizations who would on certain days of the year plaster um, little factoids around campus. And one thing I saw pl plastered a lot was that women attempt suicide at four times the rate of men. But as, you know, we've been discussing, men do commit suicide at far higher rates. Why is there this split where women attempt it far more, but men actually commit it far more? Yeah, I think it's about two to one, but nevertheless, the point is still valid. Yes, women do attempt suicide more frequently than men. Uh, attempting suicide is part of the, the solution. Um, it's part of the cry for help. It's part of um, committing suicide is obviously not part of the solution. So let me work with attempting suicide. Um, people who commit suicide feel that nobody loves them, nobody needs them, and there's no hope for that changing. That's three of, 60, uh, of 63 red flags of suicide uh, that I outline in the boy crisis. And it's really, I mean, if, you have, if you're a teacher and you wanna give your class uh, a, a, an understanding of who is in danger of committing suicide or being depressed, give them this 63 um, question questionnaire and give it to all the students in the class so that nobody feels singled out. It will really help you identify who is in danger. Now, girls, um, part of what girls do is if they feel they have to, that there's, there are people in their network that, would, that care about them, but are not paying attention to them, they're in the back, that their considerations of their depression are on the back burner of their friends' lives. Um, they, will, um, they may attempt suicide, and that is a way of saying, I need your help. But it's a way of saying, I need your help if they believe there's anybody in their life who might be willing to help if they know that they need their help. So the, the, the difference between female attempts at suicide and males is that the males who commit suicide believe that there is no one who would pay any attention to them if they did cry for help, or in a sense, even worse, if they did tell somebody that they knew and respected and respected them, that they were considering committing suicide, that person might be willing to help but they, they fear that that person would lose respect for them, would pity them. And men learn that, that they are not loved, they are not respected if they're being pitied. 
So men would rather commit suicide than be pitied and be disrespected. And so uh, uh, attempting suicide is part of the solution because it is, and part of the problem not being as serious as it is for the people who commit suicide because incorporated in the attempt of suicide is the belief that there's someone that loves you, someone that needs you, someone that cares about you living, and someone who will be willing to do something about it, who knows how to do something about it, and who will not lose respect for you, but will have empathy um, and um, for, for you, rather than contempt for you or pity for you. Is that, I hope that's cl a clear difference, and if it isn't, please ask yeah. the person to follow up on that. Yeah, I think, I think that makes sense. Um, next question comes from user O Carry My Captain. They want to know Do you, as a somewhat controversial academic figure, face problems of public figures, including media pundits, politicians, internet personalities, etc., misinterpreting or abusing your work for whatever purpose? Uh, misinterpreting it, the answer is yes. Yes and yes. <laughs> the, um, I have uh, you know, one of the things, even among friends of mine, uh, who um, who who have not really read the Boy Crisis or um, you know Women Can't Hear What Men Don't Say or The Myth of Male Power very carefully, but they've read about it, uh, they'll sort of like make an attempt at a party, let's say, uh, to summarize it. And my normal response is I would like to crawl under the table. <laughs> so I'm like, no, that is not what I'm saying. But if, if they've read The Boy Crisis or read The Myth of Male Power, they usually do a much better job of explaining it. And I'd say that about 97, 98% of the criticism of me um, comes from people who take a quote out of context, um, who maybe like if, if you were taking a quote out of context from this um, um, program that we're doing now, it might be where I sort of, the portions where I say what the negative sides of feminism are, and then and say, see, Warren is anti-feminist, um, as opposed to taking, and the, and the conservative might take the positive parts of feminism that I was talking about and how important it's been in the world, um, or, you know, um, and say, see, Warren is just a, um, um, you know, a, a, an old school liberal or, you know, or a feminist still. Um, and, you know, Phyllis Schlafly used to call me, um, you know, um, a, um, a hopeless male feminist. And so, um, you know, because from, uh, so people, depending on where they come from, criticize me differently. And I think as you've seen, I hope as you've seen in this program so far, or in any of, of the writing that I do, uh, that I will look at things from multiple sides. And the challenge for that, the deepest hurt and pain for me um, in that is that since I've begun looking at the world this way and, and listening to everyone's perspective and trying to incorporate them all, um, I have not, you know, I've gone from 50 speaking engagements per year on campus um, to down to zero. Um, and the one I did um, at the University of Toronto a couple of years ago uh, led to a 100 um, person uh, socialist worker party feminist um, protest where they didn't just protest my speaking, but they blocked the door to, of entry to the people in the auditorium at the University of Toronto where I was speaking so that people could not come in to hear me. Um, whereas in, you know, when I first wrote The Myth of Male Power, um, there were protests outside of town hall where I was speaking. And I was able to go up to the protesters and say, listen, there are only five or six of them, and say, listen, um, if I give you free tickets to my, my presentation under the understanding that you'll listen completely first, not interrupt, not, you know, not protest um, overtly. Um, and then at the end, you can ask any questions you want and take your turn with the other people in the audience. Um, would you okay, be okay with that? And they all agreed that that would be fine. And at the end, they were all just like, you know, you, you, we agree with most of what you say, and we hadn't thought of this part the way you're thinking about it, about it before. Like we hadn't thought of, um, you know, the attempt to commit suicide so differently, or the disposability so differently. Uh, the subtitle of the myth of male power was "Why men are the disposable sex," and you know there were none of the people that were protesting were were d dealing with that. But the sad thing is that when I was growing up in the 1960s you know, and so on, <coughs> the and Mario Savio and the free speech movement, that was all the political left. We were in favor of free speech. Um, the, it was the McCarthyites who were in fra favor of um, anyone who said anything that sounded at all communist-like or socialist-like um, should be reported. 
Now it's the other way around on college campuses. Uh, when conservative people want to speak, it is the liberals and the, and who are afraid of violating um, trigger warnings of not having safe spaces. Um, and that, you know, that is making liberals the proponents of restricted speech and censorship. And so I haven't been invited to a college campus except the University of Toronto, um, you know, in years. And aside from impacting my income enormously um, and having to have the uh, economic security and the emotional security to be willing to pursue something that doesn't pay um, nearly as much. Um, that, that, that is the, the deeper problem for me is that the university should be the, the, the place more than any other place in, in the universe that is, that is desire, desirous of exploring everyone's perspective on almost everything and having people learn how to dialogue and listen and hear each other and, and, and articulate the perspective that the others are, are saying much more uh, in a way that the person they disagree with would say, yes, I now see that you may disagree with me, but at least I feel you understand me. That's where we all need to reach in, in, this, in this world and in this life. And the university should be the catalyst of that type of method of, of, of understanding each other, um, not to be a safe haven for protecting um, um, fe feminist perspectives and liberal perspectives. That, that is not liberal, that is regressive. Not, it's not progressive, it is regressive. Okay. Uh, our next question comes from user Azerdi. He wants to know, since you acknowledge the existence of male toxicity, what do you think is the solution for it? I think the solution for male toxicity is really having liberals in particular take the lead on being um, articulate about um, the sac how the sacrifices that males have been expected to make um, have led them to develop to not being able to be full human beings that they've been expected to be full human do doings and for liberals to, to say we want men to be full human beings just like we want women to be full human beings it is important for liberals to take the lead on dropping the scenario that we've lived in a patriarchal world dominated by men that uh, made rules to benefit men at the expense of, of, of women and understand that we did not live in a patriarchal world dominated by uh, a world dominated by a patriarchy. We live in a world dominated by the need to survive and to survive both sexes developed restrictive roles that did not allow either sex to be um, able to explore the multiple dimensions of possible personalities and biological heritages that they had. Women were expected to be uh, raised children, men were expected to raise money. And so, and then third, to understand that instead of focusing on men earning more money than women to, uh, as being part of male privilege and male entitlement, understand that what the statistics show is that men don't earn more money than women per se, that dads earn more money than moms that um, particularly dads and moms that live together uh, are, are married, um, that, the, that typically speaking, the moms will make a decision to either be full-time involved with the children, full-time involved with the workplace, or do some combination of both. And that overall, they, were, they will significantly cut back on the income they're making if they're, if they're working full-time. They will cut back on the number of hours that they make. They'll, they will commute uh, uh, shorter distances. And whereas the males will be much more likely to say, if I'm a musician or a writer, like my father would say to me, that you cannot become a writer because if you, if you become a writer, um, you will, um, never, uh, the chances are only one out of a hundred, you'll find a publisher. And if you can't find a publisher, you'll never be able to find a wife and you won't be able to support a family. The great majority of males that had an instinct to write, uh, like I did, um, gave up writing if they had children because they realize that the, the precariousness of, of earning consistent dependable income over a long period of time, if they had children, was a luxury that they could not, um, that, that they could not um, pursue. So therefore they gave up writing or music or being an actor um, or being an artist that earned less money because they learned whether they were able to articulate it or not, 
that the most fulfilling occupations like teaching that are, are likely to pay less. Fulfilling occupations pay less because larger numbers of people comp compete to be fulfilled and therefore the supply of people competing to do fulfilling occupations is much greater than the demand uh, for say, somebody, somebody having a piece of art um, when they're in a, uh, a crisis, um, whereas they still need their garbage picked up. So you'll pay the garbage collector proportionally more than you'll, be, you'll pay the art historian. Um, so the man can't afford to become that art historian, that writer, that elementary school teacher once he has children, particularly if he has two or three children, and particularly if his wife doesn't work, because his obligation now becomes not only to support himself, but also his wife, or the gap between what his wife was making before and after the children were, were born, as well as the child or children, plus any um, provide for a, um, a monetary, an economic security blanket for the children so that in case there's um, ADHD or uh, mental health issues or um, significant um, um, need for orthodontist work and so on, that they have the money to be able to do that for their children. And so males give up doing what they love to do um, and often do what they feel they need to do because selling product X um, makes more than teaching. And then once they sell product X, if they have a third or fourth child, they realize that it's not okay to just sell product X locally. So they learn what I call the father's catch 22. And the father's catch 22 is learning to love their family <laughs> by being away from the love of their family. Um, so if he's, if he's selling product X locally and he then has a third or fourth child and his wife has to take care of the children uh, or wants to take care of the children, uh, he learns that he should not just be the local salesperson, but he should be, if he has an opportunity to be the national salesperson, um, he should take that opportunity, but that brings him away from home much more. So again, he learns the father's catch 22, which is to learn to, to love his children by being away from the love of his children. And so for feminists to, and liberals to look at this as, men, as examples of men being the oppressor because the outcome is the man earns more money by being a national sales rep than a local sales rep, um, then um, this is completely misunderstanding men and masculinity. And the world will be um, able to be led by, by people of a more liberal perspective when they hear that, the, that people's heart is in understanding the sacrifices that men have made to be able to, to, to have their family be protected and loved and nurtured um, to a greater degree. And, that, and the fact that men have um, kept quiet about it, that for, for 50 years now, we as feminists have been criticizing men and toxic masculinity, and men have not been saying, you know, we disagree. They've been basically burying their he head in the sand and hoping the bullets would miss. We basically had a, a war in which only sex, uh, which only one sex has shown up. Uh, women have spoken up and men again have buried their heads in the sand and hoped the bullets would miss. And that is not, and that is part of toxicity. That is part of the toxic masculinity is burying one's head in the sand and hoping the bullets would miss or pretending to look strong and taking and developing the thick skin and the emotional um, resilience that in its extreme form becomes a disconnection that leads to drinking and gambling and, um, and having sex with women that they think will, that are affairs that they think will understand them because um, they ha they're just um, addicted to the attractiveness of the moment rather than uh, a full um, hope that they will be understood. All right, our next question comes from Yukimaru. Uh, they want to know why are so few men members of men rights, excuse me, men's rights organizations, despite uh, the large number of men whose lives have been destroyed by the family court system? Yes, well, first of all, there's a, a deeper understanding of that question, and that is many people do not know. Um, I'd say that. Um, I do a lot of expert witness around the country to, um, to educate judges as to the importance of both fathers and mothers um, being involved equally in the family after divorce. I you know, partially ex explained to judges that if, if, the, if the mother and father here in court want their children to do the best um, that is possible 
four thing, uh, things are necessary. One is that there be an equal amount of father and mother involvement after the divorce. Number two is that the father and mother live within about 20 minutes drive time from each other uh, so that the children don't have to give up activities or friends, uh, birthday parties or uh, recitals um, to, in order to see the other parent. Number three, that the children are not able to detect any bad mouthing or negative body language um, about the parent that is not around. And then number four, that the um, mother and father attend not just emergency relationship counseling or emergency couples counseling, but rather consistent, dependable couples counseling, counseling at, at least once every three or four weeks. If you have those four conditions prevailing, then children are likely to do almost as well in a, in a family where they of divorce as they are in a as it an intact family, not as well, but almost as well. So the, and so what many, many men do not understand to answer the, um, the extremely important question of the, of the listener, uh, what many men don't understand is that, um, that, the, that the courts are so biased against uh, men, fathers and they're biased not because there's evil judges or even an evil system. The system is very dysfunctional, but let's get away from that for a moment. Here's what a judge's thinking is. Most judges think it's best for the children to have both parents. But if both parents are in such bad arguments with each other uh, that, they, that they have to take it to court and they can't settle it outside of court, then I have to make a decision as to uh, which parent is most likely to take care of the children most effectively. So there's an internal historical bias that that must be uh, a mother that is more likely to, to be able to be a more natural parent than, than a father. So the, that bias, we all understand. Second, the, the judge is oftentimes the mother will say, I'm afraid of the father, or you know, he pushed me once, or he raised his voice once, or I'm afraid, or he doesn't protect the child very well. Um, when he um, was taking care of the child, he let the child go to uh, the, the playground by, uh, by himself or herself, and the child got into a fight on the playground. The father went back home to watch the football game and cared more about the football game playoffs than he did about protecting the child on the playground. <laughs> and the father is not able to, under to explain uh, or articulate that I believe it's more important for the child to go to the playground, have a fight if need be, and then come home to me and talk to me about what were the what happened on that playground that led to that fight so that that child can learn how to protect himself rather than be protected by me because I want a child to be able to go out in the world knowing how to protect himself. So those types of things, those dialogues, those real understandings of the dynamics between the differences between dad style parenting and, men, and mom style parenting, they don't happen in court very well because when I go to court, the only function of the, opposed, the mother's lawyer is to try to make me look like a fool. And so the, the judge does not get a chance to see the, and, and uh, to get the deeper understandings of why both the father and mother are so important. And so the fear of the judge is, okay, if the mother is saying that she fears the father for any reason, I don't ever want to be in the position of then giving the primary custody um, to the father, because if it ever happens that the mother's fear of the father results in the father actually, the mother having a fight and the mother, the father hitting the mother, um, then I will be looked at as being a judge that is anti-female and I could lose my career. And so those are the internal processes that oftentimes go on in, uh, to judges. Now I've talked to a lot of judges about this who have been friends and have been, you know, out of the court, um, but even judges that, that, have, um, that have had that experience and believe that and say, yes, you're absolutely right, they would never volunteer that to me until I articulated that and they, and they will usually then say, yeah, I'm afraid to say that that is a lot of what's going on. Um, and so um, what we, we need, is just, which, so then the question is why don't, so why don't more men get involved with uh, men's issues because the great majority of men, I'd say almost 100% of men that uh, seek me out to be an expert witness in, in their court cases said, I thought men's rights people were just sort of like anti-woman and bitter and angry until I myself um, got a divorce and I've had the kids uh, taken away from me and I haven't had the court listen to me and I haven't had the court give me a 50-50 chance. It is not a, because we as men are biologically programmed 
to protect women. And when we hear anybody criticizing the people we are biologically programmed to protect, we become on the side of the women and opposed to those males that are saying things that sound like they could be anti-woman. And that's all part of, so the problem of men not hearing women's issues, including myself, I make myself part of this problem. The women's movement surfaced in 1968, 69, this, this wave of the women's movement in the United States. And I was on board so quickly that my students at Rutgers University said, you know, Warren, you need to do your doctoral dissertation on the politics of the women's movement. You are so tuned into this and you're, you're, um, you just, your fire is in your belly when you talk about the value of the women's movement. I was on board immediately. I got involved with changing my dissertation. I worked magic with my doctor dissertation committee who were convinced that feminism was only a fad. And I said, no, feminism is part of an evolutionary shift in which, in which both sexes are going to be, um, have the opportunity to, to, to have much more flexible roles in the future than they did in the past. It's going to be with us forever, um, but it will have modified forms and hopefully men will also recognize that they have, um, that they have um, also restricted roles and, um, and, but I said, it's going to take a lot longer for men to discover the restrictions of their roles because male roles are uh, framed as power and men are afraid to admit their weaknesses. And, and, um, and so this is all, um, this is all going to take a lot longer for men to work out their side of the coin than women. And at that point in time, I had been um, moved over to become assistant to the president of NYU, which is where I was doing my dissertation. And so the doctoral committee was a bit more um, cooperative with me. <laughs> <laughs> of course they would. <laughs> so human next, beings, are human beings. Right? <laughs> uh, next question should be real easy. Um, Garmonius wants to know what do you do to be happy all the time in life? It's a really wonderful question. Um, first of all, I am happy <laughs> almost all the time in life. Um, and second, the, the most important single thing is for the last 30 years I've been working on developing a couples communication course and um, I have um, because I started seeing that the, a lot of the problems that I that I saw myself have and other people have um, were as a result of not really hearing other people's points of view without becoming defensive and so I started looking at why that was the case and I saw that it was uh, we were biologically programmed when we heard criticism to think that that criticism might be coming from an enemy and so therefore, if it was coming from an enemy, it was our job to build up our defenses so we were not killed by the enemy or better yet to kill the enemy before the enemy killed us. And that that was wonderful for survival, but it was terrible for love and it was terrible for intimacy. And so I started to, but so I started to say, you know, uh, if this is biologically natural, then do we just have to live with this? And I felt, I just, you know, obstinately felt I'm not, going to, I'm not going to settle for the possibility that we have to live with this. And so I searched for a workaround to the biological propensity to be defensive when criticized by a loved one. And I did find that workaround. Um, and that workaround involves a, a lot of altering one's mindsets before one handles criticism. And that led to a series of other problems, which is to how to create a conflict-free zone during the week and then how to sustain that conflict-free zone and how to develop appreciations in such a way that people really hear their appreciations, how to develop the discipline of love, how to develop the discipline of appreciations. So all of these things I developed for my courses, but I also put them, in, um, I put them into my real life. So I met a woman I really fell hard for about 27 years ago. This is about three years after I had developed the couples communication course. And she and I were very different. We had different um, attitudes toward raising children and different attitudes toward, uh, she was much more Christian. I was more of somewhere between a Buddhist and a Warren Farrellist, um, somebody that didn't believe in any religion that um, had been yet so far articulated. And so I, um, um, I, so I really needed to listen to her perspective in order to love her and support her. But uh, our differences created that to be a real challenge. And, um, but what I was able to do as a result of the couples course that I was teaching was able to apply it in our everyday life. And that brings me our love for each other, the depth of our support, our ability to understand each other really brings me more happiness than anything else in my life. Um, the second thing that I think brings me a great deal of happiness is recognizing that um, that 
I feel that the, the ways that I have to contribute to the world, the things I've been saying in this podcast, um, that differ with uh, what where liberals are thinking and different where differ from where conservatives are thinking. My willingness to go to the White House and talk to conservatives, and my willingness to go to the Biden campaign and nine of the other um, candidates for a Democratic uh, cat pre presidency and talk to, with them about these issues, they all give me a great sense of purpose. Um, and even though I'm 77, and you know, sort of, I have the, the enough income now to uh, enough saved with my wife's work and her productivity uh, to be able to retire, um, I still feel enough uh, energy, purpose, uh, purpose, and and that greater happiness comes to me from fulfilling that than just from um, retiring alone. All right. Uh, next question here. Uh, let me just grab the spot again. Uh, it comes from uh, Yudicus. He wants to know, do you think people develop addictions to drugs, video games, et cetera, due to a lack of social connections? Yes, I do. Um, and here is the uh, a much, here is the dynamic that so happens most frequently. But, and this is a dynamic that I developed as a result of doing 14 years of research for the Boy Crisis book. And um, first I started saying, you know, all right, there's, the boy crisis exists among almost all, uh, in all 56 large, of the largest developed nations. In the largest developed nations, there was enough, um, enough command of survival in the middle and upper middle classes for the, the society to be able to offer more permission for two things. One is for people to get divorces if they wanted and needed to. And number two is for women and men to raise children um, by themselves um, without being married. Now, 99% of the time, that means women raising children by themselves without being married by, by um, choice. And, um, and in the United States at this moment, 53% of women under 30 who have children have children without being married. Sometimes they live with a man for a while, but those men on average last in the, in the children's lives only three to three, four years. And so, and it was among this group of children. Now, this is in the in the um, in the developed nations, where there was children being raised with minimal amount of dad involvement, or what I call dad deprived children, that was where the boy crisis resides. That is, the boy crisis resides where dads do not reside, and so this led to uh, my understanding that um, these children had a whole series of challenges in more than 50 developmental areas. So I started to say, well, what's creating these challenges? And I saw that moms were typically speaking very good at identifying children's gifts, at nurturing children, at having empathy for them, at protecting them. But so let's say the mom said, you know, sweetie, you are just a wonderful singer. You should be, you know, sing in the choir or, um, you know, or you're, you know, you're great at basketball and you're very tall as a result of your genes. So why don't you go out and try out for the basketball team? But the child oftentimes pursued the dream. The mother encouraged him or her to pursue, but oftentimes did not have the discipline to achieve that dream. And after trying three or four times to, to, to pursue the thing unsuccessfully, that the mother encouraged him or her to have the incentive to pursue, um, the child oftentimes became afraid to dream um, because what the child didn't have is what dads often bring to the family table, which was the postponed gratification, the, the, the discipline to be able to um, have the discipline that leads to the postponed gratification, that leads to the ability to um, rehearse for the play, rehearse for the basketball game, rehearse for the choir, um, and become um, a, a winner in the school. Now, when girls don't become winners, <coughs> they <coughs> they still, winners in, the, in that productive sense, they still usually have lots of girls they can talk to. When boys don't become winners in that productivity sense, in that success sense, they oftentimes withdraw. They're afraid of being, they're ashamed of themselves. And the result of that is that they, uh, they don't hear uh, appreciation and, and praise from teachers. When it comes to boy-girl time, the girls are not interested in dating losers. They want to date winners. 
Um, so the boys sort of um, start to withdraw into video games. They withdraw into um, porn or they withdraw into um, drugs or gambling. And so they can get uh, quote friends in video games or on Facebook um, that would never help them move um, if they needed to move. So they're not really what I would call friends, but they are people that make them feel like they are connected to and that to winning in that video game. And so for boys, those video games, that pornography is far more likely to become addictive um, and go from being productive, which many video games can be, uh, to becoming destructive instead. And so, uh, and, and so far more boys than when they do that, they after a while become depressed and ashamed of themselves. And that goes deeper and deeper. And that depression can lead to either on one hand suicide, or on the other hand, that depression leads to an anger at the, the girls in school that didn't um, pay attention to them, even though they were more sensitive than the guy that the, the football team that they were paying attention to. And my mom says that girls like sensitive, caring boys, and I am sensitive and caring. And so why are those girls that I like and are attracted to, why are they paying more attention to those other guys? I am so angry at that. And so he then begins to turn that, and if he doesn't have um, the propensity to talk that anger through. He just keeps it more and more to himself and he doesn't share it with anybody and that becomes bent up into deeper anger that leads to um, among our school shooters that have killed 10 or more people since the year 2000, 100%, there's only five of them, but 100% of those five school shooters that have kids, killed 10 or more people since the year 2000 are dad deprived males. Overall, mass shooters are about 90% dad-deprived males. ISIS recruits are dad-deprived males, or the smaller percentage of females who are ISIS recruits are dad-deprived females. Um, our prisoners are 93% males. The great majority of those males, 80 to 90%, depending on who you talk to, are dad-deprived males. And so the, process, the, the power of dad deprivation is that with withdrawal into video games and porn. And porn withdrawal is particularly challenging because the more a boy gets into porn, the more it allows him initially to relieve his stress um, from um, being able to ejaculate to the porn. But the more he ejaculates to a type of porn, the more excitement he needs. And then he gets more, he has to go up and up in the type of risks that the porn takes. Um, until uh, because he needs that to get uh, to get excited again, but then when he meets a real life female and invites her over to um, his home or vice versa, um, the female feels like she's just an object of porn. The porn, um, and the only thing he seems to know about sex is what he saw in those porn movies. And so when she, you know when he wants to um, to her to um, take him. Um, uh, take her, uh, to have, take him into his mouth and, and come inside of her, his, her mouth. Uh, she's maybe disgusted by that um, and because that's what he saw, saw in a porn movement. That's what he thinks he's, he's doing that can, um, that can be really cool sex, um, but it doesn't feel that way to her. She feels treated like a, an object uh, because she's being treated like an object. And so that makes him only more depressed and more likely to go back to porn. Um, Maybe one more question and um, we can. Yeah. Uh, so this one's my own. I, I know that there's been uh, different ways that the different waves of feminism have been described depending on who you ask. Um, I'm curious, how would you describe the waves of feminism? How many are there? And at which point um, did you, if you did, in fact, uh, break away um, from feminism? Yes, I'm actually, there's so much, a, a wave, <clears throat> measuring a wave of feminism is so, is so um, definition dependent. So I'd, I'd like to sort of like um, not worry too much about that. Um, but the last part of that question, something is something that I can address and repeat that last part again. At what point, I know, I, you, know you, you still consider yourself a feminist. But at one point, did you start to feel that you started to break away from feminism in some ways? I think my first major challenge was when um, I was on the board of NOW in New York City. So this was um, 
from 1970 to 1974, late 73, I think it was. And, um, and I mentioned uh, my first research, uh, and there had been um, divorces that had been piling up. And the first research came out showing that children who um, did not have a lot of father involvement um, after divorce were not doing so well. But in that, at that point in time, it, the, the research was relatively young and we didn't have longitudinal studies and the, you know, the, the control groups were not very sophisticated. But I brought it up to the board of NOW in New York City um, and I could feel this dead silence among the board members who are up until that point, they were the ones that were recommending me to speak all around the country and all around the world on women's issues. And I was sort of the spokesperson for uh, feminism and uh, the National Organization for Women type of feminism. And the um, and so um, they started asking me questions and they said, well, Warren, I thought you, you know, were in favor of women's rights um, and freedom of choice. And I said, I'm absolutely in favor of freedom of choice. I always have been, I always will be. But when a woman makes a free choice to have a child, she makes the same type of free choice that I make uh, when I make um, a decision to take a job at a university, let's say, or anywhere. Um, I make a choice to give up certain rights and privileges and devote some of my energy and time to the needs of that institution that are the boss or the company that I'm working for. And when a woman makes a free choice to have a child, she makes a free choice to um, consider the best interests of her child something that she will, um, she will consider first and foremost. And so if we are finding that um, children do best when they have a father in their life, I think that that's to the benefit of the woman, so the entire burden doesn't have to share, fall on her, and she doesn't have to feel overwhelmed. And if we also find it's to the benefit of the children, and we find that it's to the benefit of most fathers who feel like they have a sense of purpose, then it's a win-win-win situation. Well, their response was, yeah, actually, that you've made some really good points, Warren, but um, a lot of our um, feminist members are saying that if you don't that we're getting divorced and I want the option to be able to raise the children by myself. I know what's best for the children. And if we say that we're in favor of the children having equal protection, I mean, equal um, parenting by both sexes, these women are gonna drop their memberships in now. And we have a lot of fights to fight in now, not just the custody battle. Um, and so we have to keep our membership strong in order to have the most political power, in order to have the most income and money. And I said, I understand that as a political issue, but I don't. Under, but I think it's it's a longer term political issue to care the most for our children that are not just boy children, but also girl children. And even though the lack of father involvement will impact boys even more, would be my best guess. Um, I, that's what I guessed then, but it turned out to be much more accurate than I thought. Um, and then um, I think that we owe it to both our daughters and our sons uh, to support children having uh, more father involvement uh, than, than, they, than they often have, and then just giving women the right to make the choice about that. I said, everybody is territorial. Men will not, you know, some men, surgeons or lawyers will not want women in the profession because they think it's the way it should be as it is with men. And women will be the same about the parenting skills. So we can't depend on people that own the field to, um, to have a, an unbiased perspective as to who should share the field with them. And if we know that intuitively about men, we have to also know that intuitively about women. And the response that I got was still more dead silence. And the, the final comment was, well, Warren, you yourself have admitted that the research is young. So why don't you continue doing the research and uh, before you make too many comments about this? and see where that research takes you. But I could tell from the tone of voice that if and when the research did take me to a way uh, to finding out that children need both parents, um, if they're to do, have the maximum chance of doing well, um, then, um, then the, um, I knew I was gonna lose a lot of recommendations. And I did eventually find out more and more that children do best with both parents. The more I spoke up about that, the more I lost my speaking engagements going, as I mentioned before, from 50 speaking engagements at colleges and universities and institutions per year down to zero. But that was not, you know, I'd like to say that, you know, that was just a decision without, you know, my considering myself and my income or my fame at all um, in that. But I did have to consider, you know, do I want to lose 
recommendations to write for the New York Times to appear on you know, the Today Show and every other major TV show and get a lot of income in the process. Um, and uh, that, you know, that fame and income did have, a, you know, so they, they had an appeal to me, but I just decided that I would try to take it and say what I felt was honest and true for as long as I could survive doing it. And, um, and so I've, I've fortunately been able to do that. And some of the, some of the ability to do that is, gives credit to my wife for being a very good um, earner and producer and supportive of me um, in the process. So one last thing before we close up, um, I was up north with family uh, recently, and when I went to the bathroom, I saw in my parents' bathroom uh, a certain book, which I was surprised to see, uh, The Boy Crisis. Um, <laughs> I didn't know my parents even uh, knew who you were, let alone had uh, your book. So I'm curious, could you tell us a little bit about the, that book and where people can get it if they want to learn more? Yes. I say the most <laughs> the most important part of the boy crisis is sort of um, looking at all the things that can be done uh, with both the way that fathers tend to parent on average and the way that mothers tend to parent <clears throat> on average that can bring what I call two children checks and balance parenting so that they can get the best of both worlds. Now, this, the book is called The Boy Crisis, but it really in some ways boys are experiencing a crisis in more than 50 developmental areas like the suicide and the drug overdoses and the, um, and the addictions to video games and porn and everything else and, and an amazing number of uh, um, areas, obesity, um, et cetera, um, that you will be shocked by. And this is happening all over the world. Uh, sperm count decreasing, IQ decreasing, things you would never expect things I never expected when I started the research. Um, and, but girls who are dad deprived also are having challenges in more than 50 different areas as well, except the challenges are less intense and less severe. And they take some different forms like having worse relationships with men and being likely to be sexual too quickly and so on. Um, but I think that the most important part of the boy crisis is solution after solution. I, I have a real um, internal need that whenever I identify a problem, I spend time researching and digging into how can that problem be solved. And so for every problem I identify, I look at a solution such as family dinner nights, but then I look at how that solution can also be its own problem. Because for example, with family dinner nights, some family dinner nights turn into family dinner nightmares. And so how can you structure a family dinner night so it every single time does not turn into a family dinner nightmare, but turns into an enriching discussion where everybody feels heard and people are excited to come back to controversial topics being um, discussed at, their, at the dinner table where, where whatever they feel about that controversial topic, whether it's uh, supporting Trump or supporting Biden or whatever, that the Trump supporter and the Biden supporter are heard equally without grimaces and without um, sort of like little um, being shut off or cut off or say you've, you've said enough or having their perspective distorted so that the family becomes what I call e pluribus unum. So children understand that the family is one from many, that there are many, many different perspectives and all of those perspectives are supported by the one that is their family that will always be with them and able to hear their perspectives whether or not they agree with them. And so uh, where the boy crisis can be purchased is the least expensive place to purchase it is on Amazon. Um, um, and that is um, on sale right now on Amazon. Um, if, but I must say that a lot of, but if you have a, a local bookstore and you have enough money to be able to, you know, um, um, pay for it in, at a local bookstore, which is still very inexpensive, um, the, um, you can get it at a local bookstore. But I have to say that more than half of the people that write me saying that they loved uh, the Boy Crisis book are people who have listened to it on audio. Um, I, I read all of my portion of the book on audio. And John Gray, who wrote Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus, who wrote some brilliant five chapters on ADHD and how to um, prevent ADHD and reverse ADHD without taking drugs. 
uh, wrote the last five chapters of the book, uh, the Boy Crisis book on, AD, uh, on ADHD. And so um, I'd say, um, you know, if you can handle my voice, <laughs> then um, I think you'll also potentially enjoy it um, on Audible as well. All right. Thank you so much for coming on, Dr. Warren. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Farrell. <laughs> always a pleasure. It's always a pleasure. Your, um, the people who um, follow you have just such thoughtful questions, and you listen so respectfully and um, and give other people a priority and then ask some thoughtful questions yourself. So it's always a pleasure to be with you. Well, thank you, sir. You have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.